ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Kathy Griffin. that went into tonight. I bought six pair of these pants so I can pee on myself and five of them and still wear these for you. How do you like my loft? Um, yeah, I had to recreate my, my own loft. I love this loft. It's so Adrian Lyne. It's so Joel Schumacher. I just... It's very flatliners. I just want to take a lover and... <laughs> Run naked through the sheer curtains and fall down the spiral staircase. <laughs> but but I, I, uh, my favorite suggestion this week was um, from one of my, my managers, God love him, and he's going to be so pleased I'm telling this story, but he thought it might be fun to uh, stop the show at a certain point and just have a Q&A. <laughs> Just an informal Q&A, um, because I think my fan base really wants to know what makes me tick. Yeah. What is the lady like beneath the mask? I was like, a Q&A? What if one of the questions is, where are the jokes? You know, or like, like, that could get way too vicious. But anyway, it reminded me of this play that I was in a couple years ago. And this was a, a play that was really horrible, and it was called, and I'm sorry if the playwright is, you know, still alive, but the play was called, <laughs> the play was called Awaiting the Renaissance. Yeah. And uh, on the program, underneath the word renaissance, in parentheses, it said rebirth. <laughs> yeah. In case you don't know what Renaissance means. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, it was at this horrible, shitty little theater with like 20 seats or whatever. And I played uh, a paraplegic. <laughs> See, you're laughing already. And uh, I uh, would come out every night in my wheelchair with just my feet jiggling like crazy because I was really bad. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the biggest audience we ever had was 11 people. And they were all my friends from the Groundlings, and what they would do is every time I would enter in the wheelchair, they would laugh so hard they had to be separated. <laughs> Those are my friends. So, uh, so anyway, you know, this play was really awful, and I was trying to act really hard. And uh, then, oh yeah, then, there was another guy in the play who was an actual paraplegic, and I wanted him so bad. I thought he was so hot because he was all paraplegic and everything, but he had those, like, badass paraplegic arms. Like, I really wanted to sleep with this guy, and I would come on to him all the time, and I was, oh, I was very fascinated by, like, how, you know, how it would work, and I guess there's, like, a pipe cleaner they put in there, and he rolls it out, and you fuck him, and so, <laughs> and so I was just picturing him, like, riding around, and I'm on top of him, and his arms are flexing, and I'm, whoa! And so, <laughs> Okay, so get this. So I was like very upfront, you know, about how I felt. I had a crush on myself and I wanted to, you know, sleep with him or get jiggy with him. And uh, <laughs> as the kids say. And so anyway, then he did not want to sleep with me and he was a born again Christian. I know. And I'm like, I'm willing to, <laughs> all right. And uh, <laughs> like, you have to roll out a penis and I'm fine with that, but fine, you're going to pass on me. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So anyway, uh, then, but he was a born-again Christian, and he was like all, you know, oh, you know, Jesus wouldn't like it or whatever. And, um, <laughs> and I realized that's what I don't like about born-again Christians is that they won't fuck you. <laughs> you know? So, okay, so then there was this other girl in the play, and her name was, her name was Wendy, like the song. Uh, 
although I, I don't think it was her birth name. But anyway, so this girl was like one of those like really actressy girls, and I have sort of a, a loathing for just people that are affected generally. But also, she used to say that she was unloving, but really she was just an extra unloving, which I love because like it's not that great to just even have been unloving, but then to really been an extra is like ooh secrets. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's telling. So anyway, uh, she told me this story one time that it's, it's sort of awful, but you might think it's funny. Anyway, she uh, had a crush on this guy in her acting class, and she was saying, um, so yeah, I really want to sleep with this guy in my acting class. He's super cute. And she's one of those girls that describe, like a guy would have one quality and it would be super cute. And I would say, well, you know, what's he like? Or is he funny or smart or whatever? And she'd go, he's super cute. So, uh, so that was enough. Anyway, so she goes, so anyway, I really want to sleep with him. So I was talking to him on the phone last night. And then he said he can't sleep with me because he has cancer of the dick. <laughs> and... <laughs> I go, by the way, my managers couldn't be happier that I'm starting with my cancer of the dick material. That's, uh, oh, oops. Anyway, so, um, so I go, Wendy, there's no such thing as cancer of the dick. He just doesn't want to sleep with you. And I said, I mean, I, he sounds a little young for prostate cancer, you know, but she's like, no, he has cancer of that dick. And... <laughs> I said, even if he has that, if that's a real thing, like, that person wouldn't call it cancer of the dick. So, <laughs> like, that's the doctor. Look, I've got to talk to you about your cancer of the dick. Um, we're hoping for some dick remission. Uh, so anyway, then there was this other guy in the play, and uh, he was thought he was like Mr. Series actor, and he really wanted to be in Richard the Third, and he would talk about some production of Richard the Third he had been in, and you know Chatsworth or whatever, and he was saying like. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, whatever. So anyway, then, so he would do this play, and, we, and his thing was he had a wooden leg, although he didn't really have a wooden leg, but, you know, that was his character. And so he would come out, and he would have a monologue somewhere in the play about, oh, yeah, by the way, this play was all about how physically challenged people don't want to be pitied. So all my monologues were like, don't pity me. Whatever you do, don't give me your pity. If you're handing out pity today, I don't want any. <laughs> If you're serving up pity, I don't want the check, or whatever. So it just was like on and on and on. And I'm all wheeling and jiggling and everyone's laughing, so. <laughs> but anyway, this guy took it re really seriously. And so he had this monologue, which he would just slowly turn into an actual soliloquy from Richard III. Like by about the fourth weekend, he was just doing Richard III for no reason. <laughs> but the best is when he decided it would be a really good accent to his monologue to take his wooden leg off and put it in the chair next to him and then lean on it during the monologue. <laughs> Okay, so this is the guy that wanted to have the Q&A. My, my, uh, my friend Melanie and I have this running joke to this day where, like, she'll call me up at four in the morning and she'll go, yeah, I have a question for the bad actress. <laughs> so we're not going to have a Q&A. But anyway, uh, that, it is so funny because that so sounds to me like an idea that my mom would come up with, you know? And Because uh, my mom gets very focused on things, right? And her new thing is that I'm going to die from a Lester poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> you know Alestra, that new fat substitute that they put in Olean and chips called Wow. <laughs> I love that. Wow. So anyway, my mom, you know, because I guess this thing, I don't know, I guess there's maybe not so good or it hasn't been tested enough, whatever. So my mom calls me up and she's like, Kathleen, it's your mother. For God's sake, don't eat any of that goddamn Alestra. You're going to get the shit. <laughs> I mean it. Your father and I were listening to talk radio, which, by the way, is not NPR. There's a difference. L Dr. Laura? Okay, please. Oh, I know. She is, she is absolutely clinically insane. And... <laughs> And yet, strangely compelling. But, oh yeah, Dr. Laura, and of course my mom loves Dr. Laura, and she got me both of the books and hardcover and softcover and everything. But uh, Dr. Laura will like have somebody call up and say like, you know, um, I just had a recovered memory and I realized that my father molested me for 10 years. And Dr. Laura's like, get over it. For God's sake, he's the only father you have. Now go home.
<laughs> so anyway, so my mom is convinced that I'm going to die of a Lester poisoning. And she says, and, and we were listening to, to talk radio, and a woman called in, and she was in a business meeting, and she got the shit. <laughs> And then a man called in, and he got the shits in his car. <laughs> so I hope you don't think you're going to be real goddamn cute and eat that goddamn Alestra. That's, that's my mom's other thing. She always thinks that I'm being really high and mighty. Like, everything is like, well, I hope you're proud of yourself. You had to be so high and mighty and shop at the Robinson's May. <laughs> real fancy, real highfalutin. <laughs> The 99 cent store is good enough for us. <laughs> My parents are so in love with the 99 cent store that they actually moved to an apartment strategically placed near their favorite 99 cent store. And you can only imagine their devastation when the 98 cent store moved in just miles away. <laughs> when I think of the pennies your father and I have spent at that goddamn 99 cent store. When there was a perfectly good 98 cent store a couple miles down the block. I don't care if the toothpaste is from Mexico, it's fine for us. <laughs> We're not all so high and mighty, Kathleen. We're not all so goddamn highfalutin. Oh, another thing that's great about my mom is she compulsively swears and doesn't know it. Like, I mean, she doesn't have Tourette's. Oh, I could never get that lucky. <laughs> Can you imagine how dreamy it would be to have parents with Tourette's? Oh, I would be in heaven. But anyway, that is one funny fucking disease. I'm sorry. Don't be so highfalutin, you know it's true. But anyway, but she swears all the time. And she'll say, cause, well, because we're Catholic and nobody uses the Lord's name in vain more than Catholics. You will not hear God damn it more than in an Irish Catholic home. So anyway, but she'll say, for Christ's sake, you do your goddamn impressions of me for your goddamn friends. Jesus Christ. Shit, Kathleen. <laughs> Jesus Christ. God. Oh, you know what's great though about my parents? They won't say the F word. They say thick. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they think that they're fooling you. Oh, this God. Damn fickin' traffic. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, like, like if I'll buy, like, let's say I buy a shirt, you know, for $40. My parents have this, this, like, view of things costing what they cost in the Depression. So, it's, like, if I have, God forbid my mom would come over and see, like, a price tag. Oh, Jesus, 40 bucks for one stinking shirt? Your father and I could have bought a Pontiac with 40 bucks, for Christ's sake. <laughs> And by the way, what's over here? What is she, I don't know, what is she pointing, what's there? It's like over there is reason, the land of reason. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they also, uh, my parents love the wine in a box. Oh yeah. Big, big fans of the wine in the box. Oh, you gotta have your liquids in glass. Oh. This fancy pants. You keep spending money like that, you're gonna have to live in that car. My mom always says, I hope you like that car, you're gonna have to live in it. <laughs> then you won't be so goddamn cute. But yeah, they have, they, they love the wine in the box, and I'm like, Mom, you guys are having a cardboard kegger. <laughs> That's what that is. <laughs> it's got a tap. I mean, it's got like a little spigot. Oh, God love them. All right, but, <laughs> but they're banned from this show for some reason. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but um, I, all right, I want to talk to you about my favorite new channel. I am so all over VH1 now. I think VH1 has the best program. Okay, first of all, I, like a few years ago, I thought they were sort of square, you know, but now they're so moving into the millennium. They got the pop-up video, which, yeah, it used to kind of bug me, but now I think it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, and then, did you, oh my God, they have the best specials. Did anybody see the special? about a week ago, and they're still running it, with Madonna and Rupert Everett. Okay. Have you guys noticed that Madonna's British now? Okay. 
Let's talk about her lineage for a moment. <laughs> Raised in Michigan, moved to New York, is British. <laughs> I, they, okay, did, she started turning British like at the Golden Globes. And, you know, she was, she was doing the interviews, and, and uh, she, she says telly instead of television. And she uses the word actually way too much. So, and then she's also sort of bringing her voice down to a register like around here. And she's being interviewed for the Golden Globes, and she's got the whole, you know, the crazy hair that everyone hated, now everybody has. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, they were saying, well, Madonna, you know, it's, we're so glad to have you at the Golden Globes. Well, actually, it's more fun to come here than to watch it on the telly, you know. <laughs> from the Midwest, it's a TV. <laughs> so then, okay, so then remember the Golden Glow, she announced the best actor and it was Jack Nicholson for As Good As It Gets. And she reads it and she goes, and the winner for best actor is Jack. What's wrong with her? When is somebody gonna stop her? I mean, I love the Madonna, don't get me wrong. I love the hits, God bless her. But, um, and the special, this is so great about this. So in the special, it's like, I forgot what it's called, Madonna Revisited or something like that. And she's with Rupert Everett, and he's interviewing her. And I think that that was a very conscious choice because I think Madonna thought then it would look like just a couple of Brits sitting around talking. You know, having some scones. And so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, this, this special was so great because it was Madonna going to all of her old New York haunts and just fucking busting in on people. Like she, <laughs> she, they're walking around and they're talking in the limo and she's saying actually like every other word. And then, you know, they get, they went to like the mini mart she used to go to and she was saying, um, do you remember me? <laughs> I used to shop here. I loved the food here, Rupi. And I just, I, she became so Dickensian before my very eyes. And I wanted her to just lapse into actual Shakespearean. Well, hey, well, less than an odd. Me thinks me sees me in the apartment. Oh. That was heaven, but I love her. I just wanted to remember where she's from. Anyway, so um, the other thing is, did you guys see uh, Divas Live? Oh, Divas Live was dream me. Okay, first of all, Divas Live was uh, a, a special they had with five women uh, divas, some questionable divas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me break it down. It was Aretha Franklin, diva. Yeah. Uh, Gloria Estefan, Latin diva. <laughs> Shania Twain. Questionable diva. <laughs> yeah, there's just something about Shania Twain I just don't trust. I don't know, I can't put my finger on she's too thin. Um, I like my country singers to have the big hair and the big ass. You know? No. That just comforts me. There's something about Shania I don't trust. All right, so Shania. Then, of course, the new Mariah, which I'll get to in a minute. Mariah Carey. <laughs> the new Mariah. She's going through some changes. <laughs> and then, of course, Celine Dion. Who also sort of picks and chooses how French she's going to be at any minute. You know what I mean? <laughs> she, uh, sometimes she is so French-Canadian you can't even stand it. And then sometimes she's like a little more crossover. So, uh... Anyway, okay, so, now do you guys know the dish on Celine Dion? She, first of all, oh, she is like the rate of story. First of all, you know she's married to a guy who's like 100. Yeah. Yeah, she's one of those. So she's... Oh, yeah. We're going to get to Mariah in a minute. Anyway, so... Okay, so, so she's, she is married to a guy, I think Celine is like 30 or something like that, and the guy's like 65, and they started dating when she was 14. Yeah, okay, and... <laughs> am I terrible? So, um, and... 
And, okay, you know that she's one of like 20 kids, so she is just insanely fucked up. You just know that. <laughs> she must have just been so hideously ignored that when Grandpa came along, she was like, I'll marry you, or like, whatever, but... <laughs> oh, he, she was 14! Yes. And... <laughs> And in every interview, she just defends it way too much. She's like, I am from a big, large family. We are very musical, and it is normal, but it's the big deal. You know, like, <laughs> you know there's just issues and boundaries and secrets. So, <laughs> the name of my book. So, anyway, uh, the other thing is, um, she is, she's also too thin, which I don't trust. I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with that. Um, and she also does a, a, a bizarre chest-pounding thing that I think is a cry for love. <laughs> That is, yeah, that's some sort of a cry for love. But anyway, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> she also, uh, she also, uh, okay, so, I, uh, all right, so, I, da, 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 da. all right, so I, I went to see her show um, because, you know, I, I talk about her so much, I thought, well, I, you know, I should go see her act. So I went with two of my best gays because, <laughs> who else are you going to go see Celine Dion with? And, uh... <laughs> So we go, and we are in the very back, right? And uh, the very last row. And let me just say this, as if Celine isn't weird enough, and I know it's sort of easy to make fun of her because she's sort of like the female Michael Bolton and what's easier than that. But <laughs> we go to see Celine, and this is the tour where she wore the one-piece white leather halter bell-bottom jumpsuit, which to me screams yeast. And yeah. in the cotton panel of that outfit for me. But, you know, I admire her moxie. So, so anyway, you, so that, I, I am, I'm kind of fascinated by that, but anyway, just that scrubbing out process, night after night, you know. <laughs> I get so much grosser than this in like 10 minutes. Anyway, uh, <laughs> So, okay, so anyway, so we go see the show, and we're in the back row, and as, as kind of, you know, strange as Celine is, her fans are just freaks. So anyway, <laughs> she's doing the show, and I certainly will, you know, hand this to her. She has an amazing, amazing voice, and she totally delivers live. I mean, she's just a great, great singer, you know? So anyway, so she's doing her thing, and at the time, her big hit was the Up Close and Personal theme song right so anyway she's doing the show doing the show and I could feel like a tension in the audience almost like when's she gonna sing the close and personal song because like you know she's going on and on and you know she's singing about the fucking children or whatever and and you know that's all well and good but they want the hits so anyway she go you know so she, she goes off stage everybody claps she comes back on she sings some bullshit song in french nobody cares about and then now the fans are absolutely edgy right so they're like um um wait a minute um can i speak to so anyway then so so she goes off again she comes on for the final encore and she starts the for all the the place goes ape shit okay there are gays flying everywhere Just, it was like it was like the who in Cincinnati I thought I was going to get trampled to death <laughs> but uh <laughs> so anyway so, so that was great okay so anyway so D Diva's live so anyway then oh did you guys hear the rumor that Celine and Mariah don't like each other, and ah, oh, that would be, how, oh, that would be dreamy. So I would, like, that sort of thing would make me just, like, go undercover as a crew guy with, like, you know, a baseball cap and a, hey, how are you ladies getting along? So, uh, with, like, my boom mic. So, uh, anyway, so I heard that they didn't get along and that they asked to be placed at separate ends of the line for the ending diva jam session. But I don't know if it's true and I don't care if it's true. I just love it. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, okay, so Mariah Carey, 
I, first of all, I, I, I love her story, right? She once again gets famous very young. She marries the old rich guy in the mafia. You know, how, oh, uh, come on, you read Vanity Fair. So, Vanity, <laughs> Vanity Fair did the best article about them last year where they had like an aerial picture of their compound. I gotta get me one of those compounds. Everybody's got one. You don't want a house, you don't want a mansion, you want yourself a compound. So anyway, they have like the compound, and this thing's like biggest, you know, Mall of America. So anyway, so she marries Tommy Mottola, who's the head of Sony Records, who's in the mafia. So, um, or like, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, whatever. I think if Robert De Niro goes to your wedding, you're in the mafia, that's all I'm saying. So, um, but this is, <laughs> But this is what I'm fascinated by. How much money do these girls need? Like, Mariah Carey is so rich, and then she marries that old fart. Like, ah. Anyway, so, so anyway, so she married him, and then, according to Vanity Fair, did you hear this thing that every time she would leave the compound, he would put a trail car on her? So every time she goes somewhere, there's Tommy Mottola's, like, thugs or whatever following her. So anyway, she finally divorces him, and she goes crazy. And I love the new Mariah. She is, in Diva's life, she had this fucking weave that was like, leave me alone. It was just, <laughs> woo! Just, thank you, you know? She is working it. And she now, God love her, she wears like scarves that pass for dresses basically it's like a little patch little patches of fabric with some fringe and she's calling it a dress but uh but anyway my favorite thing is that she gets away from tommy matola and she could not fuck more black rappers yeah oh yeah if your name is puff or daddy she will fuck you Because, because you know what's going to piss off like a guy in the mafia more than that. You know he's at home like, oh, damn you, Mariah. <laughs> and now my vagina material. I... <laughs> Although, I have to tell you, I really, I actually prefer the word pussy. Hear me out. I know that a lot of people find that word very jarring and offensive. So, luckily, my friend Moses told me that there's a new way to say it that isn't as offensive. And the new way to say it is, pussow! <laughs> and so you can talk about your pussow all night. And <laughs> Although, mine, I, I go a little further with mine. Mine is more like, pussow! <laughs> Because she's a little hellcat. So, uh, so, all right. So, so here's here's the three stages of my. Um, okay, let's say like like if she's going through a phase because she's a whole entity. Believe me, that's where it all happens. And, and my girl likes to party all the time. All right. So let's. I'm going through a phase where I'm, you know, let's say, not getting any, little inactive. Then she turns into an old-fashioned western town. So there's, there's like a dirt, dirt roads, and all you see is a tumbleweed going by. And this is the music you hear. Dun, 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 dun. And then she's just dressed like an old-time prostitute, you know, with a big hat with a feather coming out. <laughs> Offering blowjobs for two cents. Which even then was a really good deal. Or if it's a slow night, she'll do a twofer. But anyway, um, all right, so that's when things aren't going so well. But then, if things are going great, there's a, like a lot of action, then it turns into a 70s gay rave. And <laughs> then there's like a mirror, you know, disco ball. And, um, she, you know, she dresses, like, she dresses like the old Madonna, you know, with like all the layers, and she dances like, whoa, and she loves the song Holiday. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> all you can hear then is like, ooh, Where's that party? Party over here. The roof. The roof. The roof is on fire. The roof. The roof. So, uh, yeah. And so that's, that's like nights when she feels like she's just on top of her game. And, um, you know, like a penis walks by and she's like, come here. 
party time. And uh, <laughs> so, and then, and then of course there's always like the ugly morning after. You know, when she's partied a little too hard. And, uh, you know, she doesn't know when to stop. And, um, and so she wakes up in her studio apartment with the shag carpet. And, uh, like a half a spilled bottle of Jack Daniels on the floor. And she's got those blackout curtains like in a hotel. She wakes up about two, three in the afternoon, smeared mascara. You know, just doesn't know what happened, you know. And, uh, you know, she gets up and she's all, you know, she's just been at it all night. So she's got like a sling, you know, her arm in a sling. She's limping. She's got a shiner. And she's really defensive. Like, all she can say is, you should see the other guy. <laughs> oh, God, love her. Do you want to see? No. So, uh, would that be... Wouldn't it be great if I could just open my pants and like, we love the funk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, okay, so, I got to meet the president. All right, total, total change of topic, but you'll see, now, you, now that you've seen my vagina material, you know how inappropriate that is. So, so my managers get this call, and I have an offer to do stand-up for the president, 25 minutes at a DNC fundraiser. What's wrong with them? I have my five minute pussy chunk. Um, and then I got 20 minutes of dead air. So I don't even know what they're thinking. But I, of course I was like, okay, you know? So the deal was I was gonna be the only performer at this fundraiser. That's also so weird. But because I was, I could bring as many people as I like and I could bring my parents, which I loved that idea of my mom just going off on the president. Oh, well look who's so goddamn high and mighty. I hope you're happy. You probably spent half the goddamn defense budget on that suit, for Christ's sake. So highfalutin. But anyway, um, so I was like all over that. And uh, so I, I was all prepared and stuff. And then they do a security check on me. And I was so excited about that because I thought, you know, I was hoping that they would find I killed a man, but I blacked out or forgot about it or something like that. But I didn't. But oh, oh, you know, you know, it's another sort of like side fantasy. And this is just really angry. And I am owning that. But I sort of, <laughs> I sort of have a fantasy about like taking a guy back to my apartment and then giving him a roofie and then date raping him. And, <laughs> and he wakes up the next day and he feels all dirty and he doesn't know why. And then I just look at him and I go, well, look at the way you're dressed. You look like a whore. And, and he's all, but I, anyway, so <laughs> that's just a little anger. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, and, but, oh, but they did say this though. They said, you can say whatever you want. Uh, cause I said, well, well, you know, I, I tend to cuss a lot, you know, um, what happens if I do that? And she said, you can, you can swear. We don't mind that, but you just can't say anything about the president and especially the current scandal. There goes my act. So, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, because let me just say this, I love Monica Lewinsky. She is my home girl and my idol. I just love her. And she's so like the type of girl that would, that I would want to be one of my best friends. Cause she is that girl that's going to blow a guy and then call you up and tell you all about it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I love, oh, I also love that she got a makeover. If you, if you are involved in a scandal in this country, you get a makeover. I mean, do you remember the first day Marsha Clark walked into that courtroom with her new makeover? With her Alan Edwards sleek look? Um, although, then let me just say this. Do you know what I, drives me crazy? Is I hate when guys act like she's not cute enough to blow the president. You know when guys are like, yeah, well, if the president's gonna have an affair, he ought to at least pick a cute chick. <laughs> oh my God, she blew him 37 times for a cup from Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> She's cute enough. But let me just say this though, when you guys were watching all that Monica coverage, didn't you just think, there but for the grace of God go I? I mean, they dug into her past. I mean, can you imagine them going up to every person you ever slept with, every person in your past? I don't know about you, but I fucked a midget. I have secrets. I do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway.
anyway, so what they said to me was they said, okay, so you can't, you know, you can't talk about Monica Lewinsky and all stuff. So I said, okay, fine, I'll just talk about whatever. So anyway, so then they do the security check and everything. And then about a week before I was supposed to do it, they call me and fire me. So they called and they said, well, you know, it's nothing personal, but the White House is uh, uncomfortable with having a stand-up comedian. And so we're going to have a musician instead. And they said, you know, the president has just been, had talked about so much on the talk shows and all that stuff. And I said, I understand. So then they canned me and then they hired Jewel, which is total trouble because she's way too hot for him. You know what I mean? She's all, I have real boots. And I used to live in a van. Ha! <laughs> you know? He's, he's not up to that at all. So, so anyway, so then, so then, but they said, but you're still invited to go to the event. So uh, the excuse was that since I wasn't performing, I was one of the celebrity hosts. Yeah. <laughs> So the deal, the deal with this event was that people had paid whatever amount of money to not only hear the president speak, but also to be seated with a celebrity. And what a treat for them that was. <laughs> when their celebrity was me. I was like, oh God, and, all right, any excuse. But I, of course I wanted to go, you know? So we go in, okay, so now the deal is since, since I'm a celebrity host, I get to be in on the photo op. So now there's this receiving line to have your picture taken with the president. So I'm in line, right, and there's all these famous people. I mean, you know, the Spielbergs and Ted Danson and Mary Steenburgen and Whoopi Goldberg and Danny DeVito, like all these big stars, right? And then there's me. So I'm there, and then get this though, behind me is Cheryl Teagues, former model. So now I'm like, oh cool, so Cheryl and I are like, and all of a sudden we're in the same boat. We're like the lower end celebrities, you know? So, <laughs> so I turn to Cheryl Teagues and I go, Cheryl, can you imagine, you know, how bummed out these people are gonna be to see, you know, to be seated with us? And then she goes, what? And I was like, oh. <laughs> She didn't even know. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so I'm in the receiving line, and then you know we're getting closer to having the photo op, and then I'm thinking, you know what? I don't just want a normal picture with the president. I want like a wacky picture. So, <laughs> like I had these fantasies of like uh, the president and I to do like a Charlie's Angels pose, <laughs> you know, or one where like an I'm a stupid where I'm going like this and he's going like this. <laughs> so. <laughs> And you know, if you're gonna be photographed with the president, this is the one to be photographed with. You know, if, if it's like me and President Bush, it's me and Mr. Boring, but this guy fucks around, it's great, so. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Give me that guy. So anyway, then, um, so I thought, okay, well, he's, he's not gonna do that, right? So then I thought, okay, what can I do that's sort of more subtle? So then I had this great plan. I was carrying this adorable, brown satin Kenneth Cole clutch, because I'm an autumn. And um, I, so I was carrying like this little clutch, and then clutch purse, and then I thought, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. People were walking up in twos, and you'd walk up, and the president would put his arm around your shoulders, they would take the picture, and then he would like move you along. It was all about like, get the fuck out, and move along, let's go, next. And um, so anyway, I thought, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll get in position, and then right before they take the picture, I will just casually say, would you hold my purse? And you know, what gentleman worth his salt wouldn't just instinctively go like, oh, okay. Because that's like, that's how you have to be with guys. You have to fool them and, and just say something really fast. And then maybe they'll do it. So anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I, and then I thought there'd be, I'd have this funny picture of me with the president, he's holding my purse. So, um, so anyway, I'm in line and I'm in line, I'm getting close to the line. And then there's, we're only like behind two people. And then uh, the security guy says, um, oh, miss, I'd like to take your purse. And I was holding, I was like, um, I'll just keep it. Uh, they checked it. It's, there's nothing, you know, scary inside or anything. And then he goes, no, no, we have to take your purse. And I go, but I have to hold on to it. And he goes, miss, we hold it here for you and then we give it right back to you. And then I go, but I'm going to do a bit with it. <laughs> and then, and then he says, totally seriously, he goes, the president doesn't do bits. He's down with the lingo, he's riffing, he's talking about his college 50. Anyway, so, so, so anyway, I was like, ah, oh, shit. You know, so anyway, then, so I had to give him the purse. So then I get in line and it's our turn and there's like a, I get like a doyen or something. That's the person that tells the president who you are. So it's our turn and I hear her go up to him and say, this is Kathy Griffin. She's on the show Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields. And he goes, what? 
And so then we're here, right? It all happened so fast. And so I said, uh, Mr. President, it's an honor to meet you. My name is Kathy Griffin. I am on the show Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields. And he's like, okay, you know, like, I didn't even ask you, what are you talking about? You know, like, like, <laughs> who are you, miss? And so, so then, then my manager, Scott, was standing like this, and the photographer says, sir, put your hands by your side. And then the president goes, what? And I go, he said, take your hands off me. <laughs> to make him laugh <laughs> so anyway he just looks at me and like what and then they take the picture and it's over so the picture's like like you know what I mean so anyway then I, I don't think he, it was so oh it was such a failed attempt of a joke and so he just was sort of looking like what he, I don't think he quite heard it but what he knew was inappropriate I don't know so anyway then he turns to me and he says very seriously he says well uh, I enjoy your show very much every week and then I go yeah like you watch suddenly Susan what was wrong with me but then he gets like pissed and he goes like this yeah I do so then I'm like whoa so I go and I'm not trying to cover I go oh, I just would have pegged you you know for more of a just shoot me guy <laughs> <laughs> and then he literally like move I feel his hand off of the small of my back and he like moves me out so he just pushes me out but um but, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was such a disaster Okay, this is a totally sort of off the beaten track, and I don't mean to be like a comic that talks about like the difference between men and women and why women are superior. But one thing that I do find interesting is is this. I <laughs> I, I am fascinated by what men find to be sexy, and I think it's really interesting that men love that chain Hooters, you know. And sort of, I think it's sort of pathetic, but you know, but they apparently love just going to a restaurant where they're going to see some girl, you know, with a tight T-shirt that says Hooters with her real or fake boobs or whatever, and they just love that, and they're like, ooh, look at those Hooters, give me some tater skins, you know, like, <laughs> like that's really their idea of fun is a mystery to me, but I was thinking that that would so never fly with women if there was a chain called Balls. <laughs> And, and it was just guys in Speedos with the fabric tautly across their shapely balls showing every outline and every vein. And women are like, hey, nice balls. <laughs> Can I get some zucchini sticks with that, girls? Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> <laughs> but one, one, uh, one fantasy I do have, I sort of fantasize that I have this other life, and I get this when I go to a department store and I see a really great suit, you know, like a great DKNY suit or an Anne Klein 2 suit or whatever, and I think, why can't that be me, you know? I mean, because on Suddenly Susan, I get to wear, like, the crazy Rhoda Paisley pants, you know, woo! And... <laughs> And you know, when I'm doing stand-up, it's like, you know, like pants and like slutty little top and <laughs> work the rack. And so anyway, then, <laughs> and so, uh, so it's more like this, but I sort of have this fantasy that I have this, that have this other life and I wear this suit and I don't know exactly what I would do. I don't, this is like not my world at all. I don't have a computer or anything, but I know that I would wear this suit. It would be tailored, and it would be a beautiful brown or mustard, and it would be very form-fitting in the waist, and I would go to the office all day where I'm CEO of the company, or perhaps CFO, and I would be in charge of post-its and whiteout and lots of things that are official, and I would have a, a, a board meeting. I'd have a meeting with the board members, and I would have graphs, and I would have a pointer. I would use my pointer a lot. And they were, and every, all my subordinates would be men, and they'd all be very nervous that heads were going to roll and that I was going to fire someone. And I would be there in my suit, and I'd be demanding the fiscal year-end report. And I would say, well, then give me the blueprints and the sheets. Give me the facts and figures immediately. I demand it or else. You'll pay. And then... <laughs> intimidated by me because they know that Miss Thing might be on one. And, and, and I'm wearing
wearing my suit, but underneath it, I'm wearing very naughty, sexy lingerie. <laughs> and it's push-up bras and all been garter belts, and the only one who knows about it is Javier, the copy boy I'm fucking on the weekends. <laughs> into the meeting and he hands me a folder of something and I give him that look like see you at five but not a minute sooner I'll fire you too Javier <laughs> and we Xerox ourselves making love all the time but it's a secret shh <laughs> and I go back to my condo in the marina <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway oh okay get this this is all right this is a hideous story but maybe you'll be with me maybe you won't all right here we go I met Hanson Everybody's ears pricked up a little bit then. All right, so, okay, so get this. Let me break down Hanson for you. First of all, there's Isaac, the oldest Hanson, and he's got braces, and he's, like, not as cute. He's the more, like, troubled, confused Hanson. You know, and he's, I think he's the sensitive Hanson. Then there's Taylor, the hottie. Taylor's the middle Hanson who looks so much like a woman, it's disturbing. <laughs> But the teen girls love him, the teen girls are not threatened by it, and they love him for it. Okay, then there's the littlest Hanson, Zach. And Zach is the fun, the whimsical Hanson with the, the dreads, you know? So when I first met them, once again, I tend to say inappropriate things around famous people. Uh, <laughs> but also, I just, I don't know, I guess I was trying to make them laugh or whatever. So I meet them, and of course they don't know who I am from Adam. So they was like, Kathy, this is Hanson. So I go, so Hanson. Which one of you boys is coming home with me tonight? <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> the little one just kind of laughed. Taylor had no response. And Isaac was like, um, that's inappropriate. So, uh, so anyway, I was like, all right, fine. So Hanson does their interview and then they go back and they're eating breakfast. And um, then I go and I have my little time on the couch. And they said, so tell us, you know, what's, what's going on with you? And I said, and I, I just bagged, like, they do like a pre-interview. I just bagged that. And so I said, um, well, I have an announcement. I'm leaving Suddenly Susan. I'm quitting stand-up. And I'm going to be a full-time Hanson bitch. And so, so then, and I forgot it was a live show. So the crew's like. <laughs> so then Hanson goes like this. What? <laughs> like that, and the little one is super excited that I swore, and he's like, wee, 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 the lady swore, the lady swore. And so anyway, then it's time for the interviews, and then, oh yeah, get this, then the other guest is Peter Fonda, who is a lovely man and was fabulous in Yuli's Gold. There's maybe a little bit of drug residue still in the system, that's all I'm saying. He's... So anyway, then, then Peter Fonda does his interview. So then the producer comes up to us and they said, okay, Hanson is now going to go downstairs onto the sidewalk and they're going to do a live performance. And this is in like Midtown, New York, right? And so while that's happening, we would like to get, uh, we would like to film you and Peter Fonda boogieing to Hanson. How fucking weird is that? I'm with, <laughs> I'm with Captain America boogieing to Hanson? So, but I was in, I was like, you got it. So, so, so anyway, uh, so we go downstairs and now the outside, like the sidewalk, they have like a platform and this, you know, sign, hands and everything. And the place has gone crazy, right? So there's all these teenage girls and they're about, you know, 10, 12 years old and they are going crazy. They have the signs, you know, we heart Hanson and Hanson forever and everything. So they're, you know, it's like crazy. So we go out. And then Hanson does their song. I think they sang mm bop. And the girls are screaming with their signs and ah, whoa, you know, and I'm watching them like, wow, this is amazing. So then I feel this nudge. And I had forgotten about the thing about us being filmed. And so Peter Fond is nudging me. And then I turn, I was like, oh, that's right. So I turn around and this is what happened. And I shit you not. Okay, the mic, the mic is me and I'm Peter Fonda. So I turn around, I feel, I, and then this is what happens. <laughs> I was like, Peter, that's my leg. So, <laughs> Peter Fonda freaking me. So, <laughs> I, what can I do? I was like, yeah. 
Sure, I'll do it. So anyway, then, then, okay, they finish the song, and the girls are going, whoa, we love Hanson. So then the female hosts of the show, she goes over and she starts interviewing the little girls. So she goes up to one, and she's maybe 10 years old, and she says, tell me why you like Hanson so much. And the girl's answer was, ah! That was it. She could not verbalize. Then... She, she goes up to the next little girl, and I, I don't know if you'll think this is funny. I just thought it was such a funny thing to say to a 12-year-old. She goes, wow, you must love Hanson. You look like you have the vapors. <laughs> like, like a little kid knows what the vapors are, you know? So, so I just pictured this little kid just turning into a Tennessee Williams character. Oh, my Lord, I have the vapors. <laughs> I just couldn't stay in it. Oh, I need to get me a mint julep and sit down on the porch. Oh, Brick, why aren't you a man? Oh, hey. And, all right, so she had the vapor. So then, so then now, so now it's the end of the show, and it's time for us to sort of say our, you know, like, goodbyes, thank for wa thanks for watching, whatever. So the producer says, okay, go stand, you know, next to Isaac. So I said, all right. So I go stand next to Isaac Hansen, and they're all, you know, they're just finished, and the girls are going crazy and stuff. And so we're kind of standing there, like, clapping, you know, like, wee, and they've stopped playing. They're just sort of, like, clapping, like, thanks for coming, doing that. And then, but the camera was still rolling, and so I just, I don't know what came over me, but I thought... <laughs> Okay, so I just thought I was, okay, let me just say this. I did something wrong, and I'm admitting it. And I'm going to tell you what I said, and you're going to turn on me, but maybe you'll come back. So anyway, I, don't, I was just trying, I don't know what I was thinking. I turned to Isaac Hansen, and this is in the middle of all this fervor, and I just go, so uh, you guys must get a lot of pussy, huh? I know, I feel the shame. And the minute I said it, like the word pussy wasn't even, it was like during the put, I was like, what, what are you, what are you saying? Why would you say, oh my God. And so he turns to me and he goes, what? And then I repeated it. Another reason I should not be an au pair. So I don't know why I repeated it like a weirdo. So I go, so you guys get a lot of pussy. So then he looks at me and he goes like this. Do you believe that? I swear to God. He goes like this, as if to say, like, yeah, we got a fair amount of pussy. I mean, uh, you know, the little one kind of cramps our style, but normally, normally it's pussy, pussy, pussy. Wow, we love pussy. We're handsome. We love pussy. And the pussy train runs through town. I'm on the caboose because I love pussy. Wow. One, uh, you know, like I said, I'm very lucky. I feel like chairman of the fucking lucky club. I have the greatest job in the world. The one thing that's a drag about being uh, an actress and living in the city is the thing that I just can't stand is I cannot stand all the girls with the fake boobs. It just depresses me so much. And my boobs are very real and they're very mushy. Um, <laughs> they are full, but they could never be called pert. And uh, <laughs> they're very floppy, but they're home. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say this when I am lying on my back making love to my man they are underneath my armpits where they belong <laughs> oh. thank you for being the best audience ever